Now, now that we've penciled out the broader picture, let's look more closely into some concrete sectors, such as agriculture. We know that emissions from the agricultural sector account for somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the global emissions, depending on what statistics you look at. At Yara, a world leading fertilizer company with Norwegian roots, they are continuously working to reduce their carbon footprint, and their ambition is to become climate neutral by 2050. Now, they are seeing results in this work, and we are now going to meet Yara's Vice President of Climate Neutral Solutions, Sam van den Broek, who claims that sustainable value chains in agriculture can facilitate the energy transition. I'm curious to find out or to learn how, and if you get curious too, don't hesitate to send in your questions through Slido and to like those who are already there. There's still room for more questions and the code is still ET Game Changers and you can check out the URL on, on the chat in GoToWebinar as well. Now, let's lend an ear to Zam van den Broek. Here we go. Good morning. My name is Sam van den Broek. I'm the Vice President for Climate Neutral Solutions in Yara. And today I will talk about how sustainable value chains in agriculture can facilitate the energy transition. Yara is a leading provider of crop nutrition solutions, reaching out to more than 20 million farmers worldwide. What less people know about us is that we're also one of the world's largest hydrogen producers. Yara has reduced its emissions the last 15 years by more than 50%, mainly by cutting uh, N2O emissions in the nitric acid production. We are targeting another reduction of 10% by 2025 and have the clear ambition to become climate neutral by 2050. To become climate neutral, uh, a key focus are the emissions in our production system, about 16 million tons or 23% of the total within our scope. We also work on solutions uh, for our logistical and raw material supply. An example is Yara Birkeland, the first autonomous electrical container, uh, container vessel that we have in the pipeline. And then we see that basically uh, we also need to work together with our customers, with the farmers, uh, to reduce the infield emissions, which account uh, for 58% of the emissions in our scope today. When we look at our production system, uh, traditionally we produce nitrogen fertilizer by extracting nitrogen from the air and recombining it with hydrogen into ammonia as a building block for all nitrogenous fertilizers. The hydrogen we extract from natural gas, a fossil source today, but in the future we aim to replace uh, part of the natural gas by renewable energy and water by a uh, process called electrolysis. And this process is not unfamiliar, as Yara used it until 1991 in several facilities to produce green ammonia from green hydrogen at a large scale, up to 155 megawatts. So, if technology uh, can build uh, on almost a decade, uh, almost a century, sorry, of history, uh, where lies the main challenge? As you can see from this graph from the International Energy Agency, traditional ammonia production based on natural gas um, emits about two tons of CO2 per ton of ammonia. This can be reduced to nearly zero by deploying carbon capture and storage, electrolysis, or biomass-based hydrogen. When we look at the color charts, uh, the costs then we see that long-term biomass uh, will remain an extremely expensive solution, while, for example, electrolysis has the potential uh, to become more or less cost parity with natural gas uh, in the future. However, if we look at the situation today uh, with the current renewable energy prices and the current uh, cost for electrolysis projects, we are still in the gray zone, where basically a green ammonia uh, has a production cost which is three to five uh, times higher than the current market prices for ammonia. And that is, of course, a challenge. A challenge that farmer and industry cannot uh, carry on their own. 
uh, there is definitely a need for further reduction and availability of uh, renewable energy prices and renewable energy. There is a clear need uh, for support uh, and flagship, flagship projects, um, a call which seems to be responded now, uh, for example, by the German hydrogen strategy, by uh, the new EU innovation fund and by initiatives in Norway and the Netherlands, uh, for example. Uh, and what we see is that uh, on top of that, uh, we definitely uh, need the value chain, the food value chain and the customer um, to be part of the equation to ensure uh, that the, the whole world of uh, agriculture uh, can uh, be part of the energy transition and uh, increase uh, its performance even more uh, when it comes to sustainability. As Yara, we want to walk the talk, so we have started on some commercial demonstration uh, projects, one in the south of Norway at our facility in Boskrun Herøya, uh, where we want to put in use the next generation of NEL electrolyzers, striving for more uh, ener uh, energy efficiency. And we do have a project in Australia as well, where we want uh, to look further into intermittent renewable power as input into uh, electrolysis and ammonia uh, production through Haber-Bosch synthesis. But as said, uh, to be fully sustainable, we need to look across the full value chain. What you see in the picture is um, a typical emission profile uh, that leads to the production of bread in Europe. And we see that there are quite significant emissions associated with the production of fertilizer and other ash inputs. We see that quite a few emissions are related um, to the use of the arable land and the inputs. And then we see fragmented uh, sources of CO2 or greenhouse gases uh, basically in the supply chain, the food processing and so forth. So as Yara, we really work on uh, providing green nutrients, which uh, has to come as part of the energy uh, transition. We put a lot of research into enabling farmers to improve nitrogen use efficiency and reduction of in-field N2O uh, through uh, uh, scientific strategies and tools. And then we count on the food chain to ensure basically that on the shelf of the supermarket, uh, we can have food with the lowest uh, possible carbon footprint. Again, we try to walk the talk and uh, have a cooperation with uh, Svenska Landmännen, um, a Swedish uh, food chain company and uh, agricultural giant, um, to work towards the world's first fossil free food value chain. So, as we see it as Yara, uh, knowledge and science, uh, together with digitalization and the right product portfolio, needs to be brought as one crop nutrition solution to the farmer in order for him uh, to improve his yield, uh, which is in, uh, in most cases, and if done right, uh, much better for the environment, to improve the quality of the food so that we get less food waste, and to basically improve sustainability, reducing the emissions associated to agricultural inputs and also to in-field emissions on arable lands. And to enable the farmer to implement such solutions, we are fully conscious that distributors and especially food chain companies will play a key role because we need to bring the zero carbon uh, footprint to the food consumer, you and me, um, buying our food at the local stores or in the supermarket. Just one example of that, Yara uh, aims uh, to bring the science at the fingertip of the farmers in the most simplified way. Uh, enabling him to apply nitrogen where it's needed, when it's needed, and even uh, field specific and specific for sub parts of the field. And this all is assisted, for example, by satellite technology, so that the technology can become available for every farmer and uh, that he can use these maps to fertilize vari variably across one field even if it doesn't uh, have a variable spreader. And by developing such tools, uh, we want to create also together with the scientific uh, community, uh, strong models and engines so that this uh, type of tools uh, with knowledge at the fingertips can also help uh, farmers reduce their emissions from their fields. 
Another example is uh, our work with IBM Food Trust to ensure that uh, all the knowledge, science, uh, data uh, from farm and field uh, can be reaching the shelves in the supermarket or the local store uh, through, for example, uh, open exchange uh, data platforms and blockchain uh, technology. Last but not least, uh, we don't only see opportunities uh, for the fertilizer um, and green ammonia. Uh, we see that green ammonia uh, has also a very high potential as probably the best zero carbon shipping fuel. A bit counterintuitively, uh, green ammonia is uh, in, in many aspects a better hydrogen carrier than hydrogen in itself. It has a higher density, volumetric uh, uh, energy density. It can be transported at minus 33 degrees centigrade uh, instead of minus 253 uh, for hydrogen. And quite a lot of the infrastructure already exists. So we see a lot of synergies here between sustainable agriculture and sustainable shipping as well, uh, united through the molecule called green ammonia. So in short, um, Yara wants to take up the glove to be part and proactively part of the energy transition, but will have to have a holistic uh, value chain approach, uh, basically from factory to farm, from farm to fork, uh, to ensure uh, that the consumer is fully part of creating sustainable agriculture. Alone, we can do so little, together we can do so much. Thank you very much. We will now open up the floor for questions, I believe. You're absolutely right, Slam. We are going to open up the floor for questions. And thank you so much for those perspectives. And also, uh, it's interesting to see how you at Yara see new possibilities and entering completely new markets. You mentioned shipping. But um, I was just wondering, can you, yep, we, I can see you well, and I guess you can hear me as well. You're smiling and nodding, that's a good sign. Uh, just out of curiosity, because I don't think you mentioned the reason why, but you said that um, you were producing green ammonia until 1991, and then you stopped doing that. Why did that happen? Oh, we can't hear you, so hang on. No, okay. no, no it should be fine, I think. Uh, Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, I think uh, the reason why, in a way, the green ammonia production was stopped uh, roughly 30 years ago was at that time uh, a simple economics, basically. Uh, natural gas-based production uh, turned out to be a much cheaper solution to produce hydrogen and fertilizer than uh, than electricity, basically, even in the Norwegian context, which which is already particular by itself. Yeah. Yes, I, I imagine that could be the, 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 the reason why you stopped it. And also, I would like, when it comes to costs, um, you described that producing ammonia, green ammonia, is expensive. Um, do you feel, in Yara, that the farmers are ready to take part of that cost in order to go greener in their production? Well, what we what we see is there indeed the importance of of the value chain, uh, right? So for uh, for the farmer, he cannot carry this alone. If he doesn't have a customer uh, paying for the delta in cost, uh, it will not work, uh, even if he wants it to. But we always use you know the simple example that if you would go and buy a loaf of bread. Um, and it would be produced based on, uh, on green fertilizer, basically, that might be only a few cents more, uh, euro cents, uh, that is uh, more expensive than traditional bread. So uh, almost you and me, uh, like in the previous presentation, would be prepared to, to pay that uh, immediately. But the reality is that there is a, a long value chain in between, in a way, the production uh, of agricultural inputs because that goes via distributors, retailers, farmers who sell their produce, which in ultimately comes in the hands of food companies and food processors who then sell it basically into a retail and supermarket chain. And in a way, that extra cost needs to be passed on uh, in every step of the chain. Uh, so that's why we find it so important that there is a full effect in a way from, from the food company side as well and from the consumer side in the end. 
um, to make sure that uh, the, the appropriate cost of carbon is included in the in the end product. Um, yeah, and you're working actively on this at Yara. And there's a question from the audience: What coordinated strategies and policies are we missing to achieve commercial maturity of key green technologies such as green ammonia? And I think well, what you're talking about here is indeed uh, the green, green in a way chemicals is the same uh, challenge that is also there, for example, in green steel or, or green cement. And then what we see is that basically the energy transition in the end was also facilitated, for example, the energy vendor in Germany by feed-in tariffs, by, by a first boost um, of support in, in the public domain. And then we see that has created so much energy and more importantly it has created a strong cost reduction uh, in solar in offshore wind in in offshore uh, and onshore wind uh, as well so so that boost makes that now a lot of projects go unsubsidized and we need uh, to rethink a system where this first boost uh, can, can also be given and uh, what we for example see a lot of discussions about carbon contracts of differences which, which are coming up in, in several settings. So on one hand that injection or boost is important and on the other hand um, we see a lot of it in, in consumer behavior in willingness to pay for you know, a zero carbon food etc. Et directly incentivized uh, publicly or maybe uh, by, by a pull from the customers themselves. Sam, I'm going to let Oscar, one of our experts, ask you a question because I know he's eager and ready to do so and here we have him on screen. So, Oscar. So, thank you for a very interesting presentation uh, again and I, I, I really like the way you look at the complete value chain for agriculture and, and how to reduce emissions in this very important value chain. But, but if you look at um, your presentation, of course, even if the agricultural value chains are going to be crucial, when you talk about ammonia and hydrogen, for that sake, uh, this is one of the energy carriers that have uh, that has a potential to be a real game changer, both in agriculture, in industry, in transport, and and maybe also in in heating. And and that makes it very interesting from our perspective to discuss. Uh, the future about this technology or energy carrier in, in terms of if this really takes off there will be a huge market for ammonia and hydrogen so you could easily see yourself from being a fertilizer company to being a, a large-scale producer of a very valuable input like ammonia or, or hydrogen and I know you have a slight preference for ammonia in that uh, that respect and uh, I think that's going to be a global commodity if this uh, comes true and in that respect it's interesting to look at uh, where to produce it and, and, and as you say if you look at the green ammonia that's probably going to be produced in, in locations with plenty of uh, renewable resources and I, I just want to also sidestep a little bit and, and in hydrogen we start talking about blue hydrogen coming from the natural gas and CCS which is not so far from the way you produce hydrogen in 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 uh, in uh, Yara today except you don't have have CCS and I want to just hear your reflections on the scalability let's say that these markets become huge and uh, if you look at uh, at uh, ammonia it's it's going to be a global commodity and uh, you may or may not be interested in how it was produced as long as it's emission free so do do you have any views on uh, on on the role of uh, uh, how to produce this in large scale uh, if it really takes off as a global commodity and, and do you think it will be a situation where the renewables will win and we can only talk about green ammonia or, or will we have this this uh, opportunities also to use for example natural gas and CCS to produce it. Yeah, I think uh, you pose a very a very rich uh, question uh, right. Um, what we, in, in essence, believe is that, uh, that the technology as such will, is not the main hurdle, uh, in, in essence, for, but for green or, or for CCS, technology-wise, it, it can happen, uh, right? It definitely needs to be scaled up. There needs to be cost reductions in the supply chains, in the equipment. Uh, definitely, yes, but that can happen. Uh, 
but the challenge will indeed be the, cap the capital intensity of, of making this at, uh, at global scale, uh, right? Because an, a hydrogen unit or, or, uh, or an ammonia unit will take several years to build is extremely uh, capital intensive. So the key will be on how, how will it be de-risked uh, sufficiently, uh, right? Which can have uh, many different elements of green finance, of early off-takers, um, et cetera. So in a way, if, if it can be sufficiently de-risked either in the public domain or from the market side, then in principle, the ball can, can get rolling and it can be scaled up, uh, right? But we, um, we have to take into account that these are in a way uh, assets that take a long time to build and these are law and need to replace over time uh, long-lived assets as well, uh, right? So, uh, and we would see the same, for example, on shipping vessels as well. It's, a, it's the same principle. It's a very capital intensive asset, uh, a new vessel, and the vessels which are there today have in principle long lifetimes. So you need to start that process now. Hmm. Good. Now, uh, Sam, your sound was cut off, and I didn't do that, I promise. That's <laughs> yeah, probably me. Uh, so I'm back. <laughs> But the thing is, we have to move on, and you can both get back to this once we're discussing in the panel discussion, because I guess the others might have some perspectives on that as well. So thank you to both Sam and Oscar for now. We're going to see you later on. And we will move on in our programme, because the next sector that we're going to scrutinise is the building construction industry or the 30% sector, as it is often referred to. Responsible for approximately 36% of the global energy use and nearly 40% of the global emissions. With such numbers, I guess the reduction potential is huge for individual buildings, certainly, but just imagine what impact it could have when entire neighbourhoods are planned and built as zero emission buildings or entities even. That is exactly what our next speaker is looking into. Aurel Gustafsson is Director of the Research Centre on Zero Emission Neighbourhoods, the ZEN, in Smart Cities, and Professor in Building Physics at the NTNU. He will let us in on some projects and show us uh, what there is to gain, but also what obstacles to surpass in order to obtain truly emission-free neighbourhoods. Aurel Gustafsson, I will leave the scene to you now. Take it away. Thank you for this opportunity to give this presentation at this uh, webinar. The title of the presentation is Smart and Emission-Free Cities, the contribution from zero emission buildings and neighborhoods. Sustainable cities and communities is one of the areas uh, covered by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And the main aim is to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. And uh, the reason for addressing cities is that more than 50% of the world's population now lives in cities and that this will increase to about 66% by the year 2050. In addition, we see that cities are getting bigger. In 1990, there were 10 megacities with 10 million people or more. And in 2014, there were 28 megacities, home to more than 450 million people. So it's important to make cities sustainable for all. And to do this, we need uh, sustainable housing and sustainable buildings. We also need more sustainable transport options and we need to create green spaces and get a broader range of people involved in urban planning decisions. At the same time, we know that buildings and the buildings construction sector combined are responsible for 36% of the global final energy use and nearly 40% of the total direct and indirect CO2 emissions. Uh, and even beyond that, we know that uh, the energy use and related emissions may double or potentially even triple by mid-century because of the need for adequate housing and related facilities, especially for people in developing countries. And also because of population growth and migration to cities and the increase of levels of wealth and lifestyles. 
some of this is the background for why EU now is implementing nearly zero energy building codes. And uh, we also see strategy documents uh, pointing towards positive energy districts. And in Norway, we have also looked at the zero emission building concept, addressing the whole life cycle of buildings. And uh, where we look at the emissions from the whole life cycle, including the materials, the construction phase, the operational phase, and also the demolition phase. And we then need renewable energy production harvested or produced on the building or nearby the building to compensate for all these emissions. Uh, so in practice, this is actually also a plus energy building. And we have realized together with partners, eight buildings aiming for the zero emission building target. Uh, we also looked at what can happen if we implement zero emission building uh, ambition levels in the building code. And we see that uh, even with an increase in the built area from 2020 to 2050, we can have a decrease in energy use uh, up till 39 terawatt hours from 2020 to 2050. This in, is in the most ambitious scenario we have studied. However, we see that uh, aiming for the zero emission building target for each and every building might not be feasible. It might also not be possible, for instance, for heritage buildings. So that's why we have increased the scale and are now working on the neighborhood scale where we look at a group of buildings and related infrastructure. So the objective here is to speed up decarbonization of the building stock, both existing buildings and new buildings, use more renewable energy sources and create a positive synergies among the building stock, energy, ICT and mobility systems and citizens. And we are working with the municipalities and cities and also other public and private project developers to, to, to realize these concepts in real areas. So the aim is then uh, to reduce the direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions towards zero within the life cycle of the neighborhood. And then we consider uh, 60 years, the life cycle of a building and uh, 100 years the service life of infrastructure and in addition to looking at the greenhouse gas emissions we also look at energy efficiency we would like the neighborhood to be powered by a high share of new renewable energy and also to have interaction with the energy uh, supply system in addition we would like to manage the energy flow smart management of the energy flow within the neighborhood and between buildings and also exchange uh, energy with the surrounding energy system in a smart and flexible way. The zero emission neighborhoods should promote sustainable transport patterns and smart mobility systems. The zero emission neighborhood should further plan, design and operate with respect to economic sustainability. The amenities in the neighborhood should provide good spatial qualities and stimulate sustainable behavior. And the area should also be characterized by innovative processes based on new forms of cooperation between the involved partners and lead to innovative solutions. New business models and uh, looking at the regulatory framework is part of this. In the Zero Emission Neighborhood Research Center, we have nine demonstration areas that we use in our research. Uh, from uh, Bode in the north to Bairum in the south. This is a mix of new developments and transformation of existing areas. And uh, looking at buildings, looking at energy infrastructure, looking at citizen engagement processes is part of this. Uh, we have started to evaluate the performance of several of these areas. And this is one example from the area Yudalir where we look at the emissions from the buildings, from mobility, from the infrastructures, and also evaluate the renewable energy production possibilities, for instance, based on photovoltaics and the district heating system. And we see that uh, aiming for the zero emission neighborhood ambition level is very ambitious. 
and with the current plans we are not yet at the target uh, but still we see that uh, aiming for these ambitions results in a, re a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Stronger focus is needed on mobility, uh, materials and renewable energy production. This is the last slide and it's uh, time to conclude. Uh, I think in making zero emission buildings and neighborhoods or aiming for these targets will help the transition to a low carbon society. For instance, by reducing the energy use and the greenhouse gas emissions related to buildings and neighborhoods with related infrastructure. And then I think of both direct emissions and indirect emissions. Further, we see that implementation of these targets will uh, result in more renewable energy production. We will see that flexibility measures are explored both in the neighborhood with the associated infrastructure, but also within buildings. And we also see sector coupling uh, in place. Further, we see the reduction of material use. Uh, there is more use of environmental friendly materials and also more use of uh, uh, old materials. And there is also reduction of transportation need because of improved planning processes and also introduction of more sustainable transport options. But there are also challenges. For instance, there are quite a lot of regulatory barriers in place today and uh, there are also problems related to having different building owners or different uh, authorities to relate to for several of the topics we are considering. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariel, for that, for showing us the complexity of reaching zero emission neighbourhoods, because this is not easy. And I can see that you're back on camera again. Nice to have you back. And I know that both of our experts might want to ask you questions in this uh, thesis defence style. So I'm going to re-invite both Oscar and Thomas to join us. Let's see if they're popping into the screen there we go so thomas was first so now you can go first and i'm gonna just lean back in and listen to whatever questions you might have thomas yeah perfect thanks so thanks for a very nice uh, presentation there's a lot of really great work going on in the sen center so thanks for that um i have a, a question sort of on uh your framing or setup of this presentation and and the relationship to the sort of work that goes on to realize these uh smart uh zero emission neighborhoods and, and cities and uh, this is set out by by sort of uh, citing the un uh, and and uh, with a sort of massive focus on inclusivity safety resilience and and sustainability um and I guess throughout the, the presentation, I, I sort of got the impression that uh, the key measure of success uh, is sort of the technical parameters and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the greenhouse gas emissions, these two things are, are obviously clearly important. But I wonder, do you also work to sort of measure these other things such as participation, inclusivity, uh, resilience, safety, and uh, could you say a few words about how you uh, do that in the center? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, the, the presentation is focusing or was focusing most on the technology side, I think, and on the CO2 emissions. But but the user in the engagement and working with different actors is, is actually a large part of the center as well. Uh, so, for instance, we have these uh, living laboratories um, or the experiments we do uh, connected to some of these uh, pilot projects. So, um, so this is some examples, and th then it can be to sort of explore non-technical measures to to reduce the emission as well. So it, it's it's uh, yeah, it's covering a lot more than what I managed to put in in this nine-minute presentation. Yes. A follow-up question, or should we pass the word on to Oscar? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I figured we were sort of out of time, so I was prepared to pass the word. So just to go ahead and do that. Let's <laughs> go. Okay, so thank you. So, so you mentioned, Aurel, that um, it's a quite ambitious target to have um, a zero emission uh, neighborhood perspective. And I, and I guess if you look at the big picture, the important thing is to have a zero emission society. And, uh, and, and from my perspective, one interesting topic would be uh, let's say you go get close to zero emission neighborhoods, but not all the way. Uh, maybe it would be as important to interact with the rest of society, to interact with the transport sector through the flexibility, for example, in electric vehicles, to interact with industry through low temperature heat or the spillover heat from industry, and, and, and more or less to interact um, uh, sort of being a flexibility provider into a system where with a lot of intermittent renewables probably flexibility will be in high demand. So do you have any reflections on, on how to balance this zero emission objective towards another objective that would be helping the rest of society to go zero emission? Uh, it's a big question, right? <laughs> uh, I, I think we, in the Zen Center, try to take a more holistic view on things that uh, are compared to many other centers. Uh, we are including transport, uh, we are including uh, yeah, or pushing for more flexibility and to adopt more renewable energy and, um, and also of course energy efficiency and also pushing for more renewable energy production. So, so I think uh, Moving the, the focus from individual buildings or only from transport, we, we sort of uh, take on a whole more holistic view in, in the way we do this. Uh, uh, yes, um, but if we tackle everything, uh, I'm not sure that's possible within one center, but I, I think we're in, on the right track at least. Hmm. Okay, I'll partly answered your question at least. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Are you satisfied, Oscar? Yeah, I think this is something we probably can follow up a little bit in the discussions later as well. But um, yeah, well, thank you. So thank you so far, Ariel uh, and Oscar. But Ariel, you can stay put on camera. Uh, Oscar will absent himself for uh, a couple of minutes now because uh, I would first of all like to thank all the five presenters for giving us so different and very interesting perspectives.